What's going on folks, Ted from Nerd Immersion here and let's get into that D&D Giant Options survey before it closes. You can get my opinion. Hopefully you're able to get in and fill it out yourself if you haven't already. Let's go ahead and jump right in. I will just say to take the time, hey, if you like what I do here, consider leaving a like on here, comments and, and subscribing to the channel. It does help drive things up and considering I am trying to obviously work my way back into content creation after being out for a little bit, uh that really i mean honestly it's a self-esteem boost more than anything else and it helps drive me to continue to do so plus i know we're like 50 days away from gen con i'd love to hit 100k by then i realize it's probably unrealistic but there you have it so here we go i also will open up the pdf in a different tab here and we'll pull up the survey so would you like to rate the material presented in giant ops and options yes What's the earliest edition that you played? Third, third and 3.5 are pretty much interchangeable and I was kind of playing both. So that's why I would just go for third as opposed to 3.5. All right, have I play tested these? No. Unfortunately, we're actually looking to set up uh, some other campaigns here on the channel as far as streaming goes. Uh, we're looking to get some new folks in as well as apparently, you know, unfortunately, uh, my two good friends, Sean and Celine can continue to play, but our previous, well, you know, kind of steadfast players, it's just not really an option anymore. So we're looking to branch out and find new folks to play on the channel. Again, this is for folks that we're playing with in person. So we're looking to start up like smaller one shots and things to kind of basically audition people. So I was hoping we could have gotten that in ahead of time, but we just haven't had the time. So what did I think about the path of the giant subclasses, the barbarian subclass? I was very... I I'm very satisfied, satisfied. I'd say I'm satisfied. I don't feel like I, I felt very satisfied with it, but it is a very strong kind of, I, I guess I would almost call it like a neutral subclass in that it provides a lot of really awesome options, but nothing, I guess, overly flashy, if that makes sense. Not that you need to have that, but all right. So giant power, uh, I'm really, uh, I'm just, I uh, don't know, not sure. It's, you know, you didn't learn giant and you get a cantrip. I guess I could say I'm slightly satisfied with that realistically. I, I don't love it. I don't hate it. So Giant's Havoc is the other ability that gives you the ability to, uh, when you make a thrown weapon using strength, you can add your rage damage to it, which is nice because rage damage is just flat damage that you can have on any attacks that you have. But now you're allowing that to extend with range. I also am hopeful that possibly if this ends up making it through, we might end up seeing some sort of ranged option for a paladin at some point. I realize it's probably unlikely. But there you go. And your reach increases by five feet. And if you are smaller than large, you become large size. Uh, so basically this is what happens when you're raging. And I also like this, that this is a built in limiting factor in the number of rages that you have. You don't have to add any extra proficiency bonus times per long rest or whatever the case may be. This is just where it tacks on when you do rage. So I'm going to say that I'm very satisfied with Giant's Havoc. Now, Elemental Cleaver comes on at six level. And I really like this because this is also just additional damage one of the things that a barbarian i feel like suffers from is they can do additional damage when they do something like roll a critical hit uh, but depending on how you play and whether you like to use reckless attack or not and if your dice are hot or not uh, you can basically never encounter critical hits or you can encounter them all the time but that only damage gets boost when you're high enough level to get access to things like brutal critical whereas i think that one of the beneficial the most beneficial things for a primarily martial class is to have ways to increase the damage as spellcasters have a variety of different ways of doing that with big boom aoe spells or things of that nature right a rogue has sneak attack a paladin has smiting and unfortunately the other marshals right the ranger the monk and the barbarian don't really have ways to add to the damage now they do have certain options right certain rogue uh, rangers can have extra attacks they can have certain spells they can cast to boost damage uh, monks can make more attacks per round oh i forgot the fighter as well same kind of a thing more attacks gives you more damage but a barbarian is limited to two attacks without you know any kind of funky things with feats but unless you roll a crit you're basically going to do whatever the base damage is of your weapon so having anything that can increase that 
is a huge boon, which is what Elemental Clear gives you, right? When you're raging and you're holding, a, you can infuse a weapon and it also gives you elemental damage, right? So acid, you can change, uh, you choose acid, cold, fire, thunder, or lightning damage. While you wield this infused weapon, the weapon's damage type changes to that chosen type, which again, if your DM is maybe a little stingy or you're just a little early and they don't want to give you access to a magic item, which I do think is an unfortunate thing because you're going to be outclassed potentially by the magic users because they can do full damage and you might be doing half to something that's resistant to non-magic attacks. But it also does an extra D6 of that chosen type of damage. Now you could stop right there and I'd actually be okay with that, right? It gives you the opportunity to turn whatever your weapon damage is, your great ax, your great sword, whatever the case may be, to that new weapon damage, adding a D6 of extra damage to it. And now it is an element and you can choose something like lightning damage, thunder damage. Uh, I'd say thunder damage is probably one of the least resisted damage types out of this acid probably being a close second but it also gives you the opportunity to choose when you do so if you happen to know that something's vulnerable to fire you could choose that you're given options but it's not just that it also gives you the throne property with a range of 2060 which again we're tying into this sort of ranged ability of a barbarian uh, and then if you throw it, it instantly reappears in your hand so it's not like you throw it and then you're without the weapon you can continue to do that uh, while raging and holding the infused weapon, you can use your bonus action to change the damage type as well, which is also a huge benefit because now you have that kind of versatility for the loss of your bonus action. So 100% elemental clear, very satisfied. Now, Mighty Impel, I also like because of the options that it potentially provides to you, right? As a bonus action while raging, choose a medium or smaller creature within reach. Uh, and you can move it to an unoccupied space within 30 feet. This allows you sort of battlefield manipulation for your allies, as well as potential damage for your enemies. They must make a strength save versus your strength, uh, tied to your strength modifier. Um, and it says at the end of this movement, the thrown creature isn't on a surface or liquid that can support it. It falls, taking damage as normal and landing prone. As I said, there's nothing saying you can't just throw this person 30 feet straight up in the air and then have them drop down. Reminder that this is a bonus action to do so so you could in theory throw someone up in the air 30 feet as a bonus action have them drop down to the ground take falling damage of 3d6 land prone and then be able to swing on them with your main attacks as a action or with advantage without having to use reckless attack so yeah and I, again i also <clears throat> excuse me like the fact that it helps to manipulate your party members as well so very satisfied and uh, Demiurgic Colossus, your reach now increases by 10 feet. Reminder, so it was increased by 5 at level 3. You now have a 10-foot reach all the time. I'm sorry, you have a, your reach has increased by 10 feet. So you had 10-foot reach. You now have 15-foot reach at this point. Uh, and if you happen to do something that like people are suggesting a bugbear, that gives you even more. Uh, your size increases to huge. You can now use your Mighty Impel on larger, smaller creatures, which is very beneficial there and that cleaver damage we were referencing now increases by 2d6 so i guess actually i'm going to suggest i'm actually going to switch to i'm going to keep it at satisfied but um i'm going to say not really much to change all right i think this is is solid overall now i also will say that i've said this before but if you're new to the channel or you're new to the concept of filling out these surveys it's exceptionally important that you provide the feedback, but you also provide feedback in a constructive manner. Now, I'm not saying you can't shit on this if it's bad and you think it's done poorly, right? Because you can do that. But as long as you do it in a way that's constructive so that they're not just going to throw out your... Because you, know, you might have some really great points, but if you couch the wording, if you, do, if you do decide to leave a comment as like, you know, personal attacks against the folks involved or saying just like just spewing out nonsense about how bad it is and it's pointless and it's lame and it doesn't provide like you know you could say that I, I don't really think this is a good ability and then explain i think that this needs to be adjusted now you might not have the answer because you're not the game designer you're not in charge of these things but you might have suggestions and they do seemingly look at all of them because we have seen in the past where things were seemingly well received or we thought they were but they weren't received well enough to make them arrive in a finished product for example the one that sticks in my mind is the brute fighter 
and probably more recently would be the multiple class subclasses from uh, the preview of Strixhaven, where they said, hey, these classes will be applicable to multiple sub uh, multiple base classes. You know, this could be a subclass for the wizard, bard, and sorcerer. And uh, it was went over very poorly to the point where they basically nixed that entirely and did it in favor of feats. So uh, I have not play tested the Circle of Primeval. Now, you guys watched me do my review on this, and this had me exceptionally excited uh animal companions are one of my favorite things in games and like i said i've mentioned that i have a very long history with druids and animal companions from my previous campaign the first time i ever played D D in uh in 3.5 so i have a, a soft spot in my heart for this and i think uh circle of the primeval is a great concept but i think it's poorly executed some parts of it are phenomenal and i like that obviously but I think they really didn't. And if you compare it to the Drake Warden Ranger, it's just it pales in comparison. Now, maybe you can make the argument that the Drake Warden should be stronger because the Drake Warden is still a ranger. and doesn't have access to things like Wild Shape and a slew of regular spells, but we'll talk about it. So uh, I didn't play test it. I am... I'm going to say slightly dissatisfied overall. Let's go ahead and take a look. So Keeper of Old, you gain proficiency in the history skill and you get to add a D4 to the ability check. That's okay. Kind of weird to see the D4 come in, but I'm, I'm all right with it. It's a little funky. I'll say I'm slightly satisfied with that. It's not, it's not horrible. So we get the Primeval Companion at level two. So this is essentially the, the main crux of the class, this Animal Companion. So no, I don't really have much to say about any of this paragraph because, excuse me, that is basically standard, what I call pet mechanics, right? The way we kind of landed on things. Uh, you can summon this thing using your wild shape, which is awesome. Doesn't require a spell slot or anything. Uh, and if it was reduced to zero hit points, you can basically bring it back, which is awesome. So you don't have to worry about losing your companion and it doesn't seem like it takes a very long time to get it back either. So let's look at the stat block itself, right? It is a beast. It has D10 hit dice. It's a pretty solid amount of hit points. It's armor class. Um, Touch your proficiency bonus. It's going to start off at a pretty reasonable 15 for level two and then make its way all the way up unless you happen to add armor or anything to it. And also, I remind you, there's nothing stopping you from adding items or things to this companion. That's just up to the DM to allow it. Proficiency in dexterity and constitution saving throws. Now, it's strike ability, and I think its reaction have something to be desired. You can see it has the action strike. It's two plus your proficiency bonus to hit, and it does a D8 plus proficiency bonus in piercing, uh, bludgeoning, piercing, or slashing damage. And then it has the reaction intercept attack, which is when a creature that the companion can see hits it with uh, hits the target with an attack and the target is within five feet of the companion. The target takes half damage instead and the companion takes the rest. So it's basically interposing itself between the person being attacked and the damage and is basically giving that person resistance and then eating the rest of that damage, which is definitely a great thing as survivability tool for sure, especially if it happens to be the druid who's concentrating on a spell. The primeval companion can possibly knock down the amount of damage to reduce the potential option of the character to fail uh, that constitution saving throw. So I think I am actually going to go pull up the Drake Warden Ranger while we're talking here just to get an idea of how different we're talking. So we can see the Drake Warden is going to get basically the same thing. Now, the Drake Warden does get uh, 14 plus proficiency bonus in natural armor, whereas we have 13. The hit points for the Drake Companion are 5 plus 5 times the Ranger level in D10s. The Primeval Companion gets 10, so we're looking at more hit points right out the gate. Stat blocks are slightly stronger, looks like, here on the Drake Companion. I will remind you that the Drake Companion does get resistance to a damage type, an elemental damage type of its choice. Um, it also starts at a plus three plus proficiency bonus to hit, and it gets infused strikes as opposed to the reaction of taking damage for the Primeval Companion. And it's when a creature within 30 feet hits with an attack, you can basically add a d6 damage uh, of whatever their particular essence is. So I do kind of like that there's a, a little bit of a difference here, right? The Drake Companion is adding damage 
the Primeval Companion is reducing damage, and actually make a really interesting party of both of them playing together. All right, moving on to... Uh, so I'm going to say that I'm uh, I'm satisfied. I would say I'm, I would say I'm satisfied with the Primeval Companion. Now, we get Prehistoric Conduit at 6th level. When you cast a spell with a range other than self, the spell can originate from you or, or your Primeval Companion. Okay, I think that's a very reasonable ability. In addition, if the Primeval Companion is affected by a spell you cast that allows creatures to make a saving throw against its effects, the Primeval Companion has advantage on its saving throw. Again, it's affected by a spell you cast, not anything anybody else casts. If the Primeval Companion would normally take half damage on a successful save against this spell, meaning the one that you cast, the Companion instead takes no damage on a successful save and half damage with no additional effects on a failed save. Now, if it was providing, this is basically evasion for any spell that you cast. And I like that. I would have rather had them basically just have a, a evasion regarding dexterity saving throws for outgoing, you know, enemy attacks. I guess this is the, it's your magic, it's your creature, so you can have it avoid your attacks, I guess, in some way. Um... I will, I've said it before, but I think one of the main issues that animal companions often suffer in 5e is a well-placed fireball will take them out. And if you have invested all this time into this particular subclass to have this be a thing, you want to actually have your companion be able to do things, right? That's, that's kind of the benefit of having them there. And if they get knocked out very early on, then it's kind of a bummer because you're basically, you are weakened by not having this available to you. So that's a bummer. Um, now, what does a ranger, Drake Warden Ranger, get at basically the equivalency level? We get Bond of Fang and Scale at seventh level, right? Uh, it gets a flying speed or a swimming speed. Um, or sorry, it gains, it grows wings on its back and gets a flying speed. So that's just flat out it has that. So, okay, and it has also has more movement speed, but it also gets the following three features. It's, uh, it grows to medium size, and you can use it as a mount if you're medium or smaller, but it can't fly with you on it, but that's a huge deal. It does an extra D6 damage in the uh, of the elemental type for its attack. So right now it's doing 2D6 damage, and you get resistance to whatever its essence type is. Reminder that it's acid, cold, fire, lightning, or poison. So you pick that damage type, and you have resistance to that, the thing that your companion also has immunity to, by the way. Uh, and it is now doing 2d6 plus proficiency bonus in damage, whereas the Primeval Companion is getting, again, some maneuver, um, some battlefield, you know, capabilities in that it can cast, it could be the source point of your spell, but basically it only gets defensive things against your spells, which again, like I said, is nice. You could drop a spell on your companion and a group of enemies, and it won't take any damage if it rolls and succeeds on its saving throw, but I feel like the Drake Warden Ranger's idea of giving you more damage at an earlier level, I think is pretty solid, especially because it's doing, uh, now we are doing a D8 damage versus the Drake Warden doing a D6, but the Drake Warden, as I said, has the ability to improve uh, character, uh, player character damage, but it also has immunity to a common elemental damage type, which it can also grant you resistance to. So prime a prehistoric conduit, I am I'm very dissatisfied with it, honestly. All right, now moving on, we have Titanic Bond at 10th level. It grows to large size. It can get a swimming speed or a climbing speed. Uh, up to you. Uh, and in turn, it can lend you some of its terrifying might. Once per turn while your primeval companion is summoned, when you hit a creature with an attack or deal damage to a creature that uh, creature you can see with a spell you cast, you can force that creature to make a wisdom saving throw against your spell save DC. On a failure, it's frightened of you until the end of your next turn. So, as I said, this is a, the large size is nice. That means you can technically ride on the creature now. It's climbing or swimming speed, also nice. Not as good as the fly speed of the Drake Warden. Um, but you can ride on it uh, a little bit earlier. Actually, no, I'm sorry, because you can ride on the Drake Companion at 7th level. It just can't fly. Uh, but you, this one can never fly, so you can actually ride on the creature significantly earlier. And it does give you this kind of freebie fear effect, which I do appreciate the fear effect. I think that that's a solid option, but it is only once per turn. So it's not like if you have multiple, um, when you hit multiple creatures or if you have some had multiple attacks or something like that, you can make benefit, beneficial use of it. I guess I should say based on that, right? 
druids typically only have one attack or you know an action maybe a bonus action depending on what you've got so being able to f make someone be frightened of you and it gets to the end of your next turn which is also nice because you can basically get two turns of this which again i do appreciate but fear is a very heavily there are a lot of creatures in 5e that are flat out immune to fear and you're getting this fear effect at 10th level and the chances of you encountering creatures that are immune to fear at 10th level are significantly higher now if this was something you happen to get at third level or sixth level possibly a little bit more usable but i think the improvement in the size is huge i think just having a fear effect is kind of boring especially because at 11th level, the Drake Warden gets Drake's Breath, right? You can now, as an action, exhale a 30-foot cone of damaging energy tied to whatever the essence of your Drake Warden is that does 8d6 damage, which also inherently increases to 10d6 at 15th level, and it is a once-a-long-rest feature until you use a third-level spell slot, again, which is still a good AoE thing that you can choose to do, whereas this, uh, the fear effect for Titanic Bond is unlimited. It's just limited to once a turn, I'd rather have some form of extra damage output. And then lastly, at 14th level, we get Scourge of the Ancients. As part of the action you use to command your companion, which again, you do use your bonus action to command them to attack, you can do uh, one of the following things. You can expend, I'm sorry, you can expend a spell slot of any level to heighten the companion's might. Uh, Hulking Behemoth, uh, it becomes huge size and gains... Um, Temporary hit points equal to 10 times the level of the spell expended. If there isn't enough room for it to be huge, it becomes as big as it can. Uh, you can spend a spell slot uh, and granting it the following benefits. So it gets all of the following benefits. So it gets that 10 times the spell level and hit points. It gets Mauler. When I hit the companion, strike deals additional damage equal to 1d8 plus the level of the spell slot expended. Now, I've had arguments on this back and forth. Uh, I don't believe this is like a Paladin Smite in that it's a D8 per level of the spell expended. That's a pretty easy thing to change by literally having it say a D8 plus one D8 per level of spell slot expended. So if you were to expend a ninth level spell slot, let's say, which seems like a waste, but let's say you do that to boost up your companion, it would do the one D8 plus proficiency bonus that would normally do. Plus now with this Mauler feature, an additional D8 plus nine because it's a d8 plus the level of the spell slot so a d8 plus a ninth level spell is a d8 plus nine so you'd be doing 2d8 plus nine plus your proficiency bonus in damage on every hit now a reminder that the primeval companion only has one attack a turn it doesn't get you know multi-attack or anything like that so it's not like you're going to be able to continually rake in the extra you know d8 plus nine damage if you were to use a ninth level spell and additionally, Titanic Stride, the companion's walking speed increases by a number of feet equal to five times the level of the spell expended, right? So we'd be adding that ninth level spell, 45 feet of movement. Uh, and then it lasts for one hour until the companion vanishes or until you expend a spell slot to use this feature again. Now, I do like this feature. I think the extra hit points is nice. The size increase is also nice. The extra damage is beneficial as well. Um, again, I will point out that the Drake Warden Ranger, again, not that it needs to be a direct comparison, but the Drake Warden just gets the extra D6 of damage for free without requiring any spell slot expenditure to activate. It also, again, provides you with resistance. Um, you get this breath weapon that you can use the spell slots to recharge, which I do appreciate. And then again, at 15th level, uh, which is the final level, uh, we had, again, we're getting our Scourge of the Ancients at 14. The perfected bond of the Drake Warden is giving them an extra 2d6 uh, as a d6 to Draconic Essence. So remind you, at level 15, the Drake Warden Ranger will be doing a 3d6 plus proficiency bonus in damage, which is, again, a constant on thing that you can do without having to expend spell slots to increase the ability of doing so. Um, it does last for one hour, the Scourge of the Ancients ability, so you have to consider that. But as I said, the Drake Companion is going to be doing 3d6 all the time as long as the Drake Companion exists. Uh, it has a larger Drake, it becomes large size, and you can now ride on it, which again, reminder, this Drake can fly, so you now have access to flight. 
and reflexive resistance whenever you or the drake takes damage when you're within 30 feet of it you can use your reaction to give yourself or the drake resistance to that instance of damage that's proficiency bonus times per long rest which is kind of similar to the intercept attack feature but it is not the intercept attack is not limited whereas reflexive resistance is but i think that the drake warden and ranger is actually probably one of if not the best designed sort of pet class because i think it pretty much provides you just about everything that you need whereas i feel like the circle of the primeval is very close but it's not quite there now it might be something like taking the scourge of the ancients ability and possibly popping it up here at either 10th or 6th level so you can get access to that earlier that might help uh possibly reworking uh prehistoric conduit to somehow maybe provide um this ability to uh you know either to outgoing spells or something of that nature maybe you could apply it to you as well you're immune to the effects of your own spells that could be interesting i'm not really sure but i'm gonna say that i'm satisfied uh i'm was titanic bond um yeah i'm dissatisfied with titanic bond and i'm slightly satisfied with scourge of the ancients and i'm gonna say this subclass came very close uh to being perfect uh i love the primeval companion companion ability however i think every uh feature after that is a bit lacking or needs to be adjusted i would look at the abilities uh abilities abilities what the hell do i spell it oh i i see i screwed up the l and the i i will look at the abilities granted to the drake uh warden ranger for ideas of how to improve okay, next is the wizard here rune crafter no and honestly i don't even remember this one it didn't stick with me at all so let's go ahead and take a look um all right comprehend languages runes of understanding comprehend languages prepared you can cast with an explaining spell slot and it doesn't count against the number of spells you have prepared i'm gonna say ah slightly satisfied i'll say i'm very satisfied with runes of understanding i think that's pretty cool runic empowerment um let's see your knowledge of runes is stored in your spell book when you cast a spell using a spell slot, you can invoke one of the following rules. Oh, uh, sorry. Runes. Life, war, or wind. Life gives you choose a creature within 30 feet. They get temporary hit points equal to the spell slot expended. War until the end of your next turn. Attacks that have taken the uh, target the chosen creature. Gain a bonus to damage. Uh, bonus equal to half the spell slot. Wait a minute. Attack rolls. Sorry, not damage. Until the end of your next turn, attack rolls that target the chosen creature. Get a bonus equal to half the level of the spell slot rounded up. And the wind rune, uh, your speed increases by number of uh, feet equal to five times the spell slot spent, and you don't uh, provoke tax of opportunity. Proficiency bonus times per long rest. I'm going to say slightly satisfied. Uh, I don't love that war. I feel like war rune could be better if it was damage, as it, like that yeah, would get a lot more play than just increasing the attack. Sigils of Warding at 6th. When you fail a Strength Dex or Con save, use your reaction to expend one of your Runic Empowerments and succeed on the saving throw. Uh, yeah, I'm going to say I'm satisfied with that. Uh, Rune Maven. When you use your Arcane Recovery feature, you also regain a number of expended Rune Empowerments. The number equal to half your... That is... Uh, we're very satisfied with that. It's taking an existing mechanic and just adding more to it. So I appreciate that. Also, I just, where did it say... Your, uh, for example, how many runes do you have? You can evoke no more than one rune per spell. You can use this feature a number of times equal to your proficiency bonus. You regain all uses when you finish a long rest. All right. Um, oh, runic empowerment are that. That's fine. And then lastly, oh, so rune maven, we were very satisfied with. Uh, and then engraved enmity at 14 as a bonus <clears throat> bonus action target a creature within 60 feet they must make a wisdom save they have disadvantage against saving throws made against spells you cast um let's see uh the uh radiance glowing runes makes a creature makes a creature visible if it's invisible that's cool and woeful curse when you mark the creature and as a bonus action on subsequent turns you can invoke the enmity rune 
Uh, the next time one of your allies hits the cursed creature with an attack roll, the target also takes a d8 force damage and the curse ends. So I'm going to say I'm satisfied with that. Uh, I agree with a lot of the online sentiment. This feels more at home as an artificer subclass as opposed to wizard. Okay, moving on. Now, do you use feats always? Have I play tested any of these feats? I have not place tested any of these new feats. Okay, keep going. Okay, how do we feel about the different feats? All right, elemental touched. Eh, slightly dissatisfied. I thought it was kind of boring, honestly. All right, then next up is Ember of the Fire Giant. This one gives you resistance to damage when you take the attack action. You can replace one of your attacks with a magical burst of flame. Each creature within 15 feet. Yeah, I think that that's pretty solid. So I'm going to say that that I'm satisfied with. I also like that it gives you resistance. Frost Giant. Use your action to retaliate. Um, must be frightened. I'm going to say I'm slightly satisfied with Frost Giant. Cloud Giant gives you the Blur spell. Proficiency in Deception or Persuasion. Uh, and it's doubled for that. I'm going to say I'm satisfied with that. I like the uh, the expertise there. Keenness of the Stone Giant. Detect Thoughts. Dark Vision. Blech. Not really that interested in that. All right. Outsized Might. I saw... Uh, let's see. Proficiency in Athletics or Acrobatics. Count as a size larger and have advantage on saving throws to be moved or knocked prone. I'm going to say slightly satisfied with that. Rune Carver Apprentice. Oh, Rune Carver Apprentice is definitely top of the list because that's fantastic. Giving you so much versatility there. And then Rune Carver Adept. Um, yeah, I think we're also going to put that one up at the top. Stole of the Soul of the Storm Giant. Let's see. Where's the active attack rolls against you? Have disadvantage. You can force a creature speed to be halved. Cast Divination. I'm going to say I'm satisfied with Storm Giant. I like the idea of. Uh, the Maelstrom Aura, and then Vigor of the Hill Giant. Uh, when you're subject to a spell that restores hit points, regain additional hit points equal to your con mod. That's, yeah, no, we're slightly dissatisfied with that. Um, I like the addition of more feats and more specialized feats. Uh, specialized should be what's in Specialized feats. I love to see a book containing nothing but new backgrounds and new feats for players to use. Okay, any additional comments? Nope. Submit. So there you go, folks. I finally got around to filling out the giant... Uh, Unearth Arcana Giant Options Survey. So let me know your thoughts and opinions in the comments down below. Did you appreciate this, uh, this Unearth Arcana? Did you think it was good? Did you think it was bad? Do you have the same sentiments I do about the different options there? I really want to like Primeval Companion, and considering I've been talking about how I want to play a Druid, but none of the, just because I want to, but none of the subclasses have really called out to me. Uh... I was leaning towards possibly doing a Stars Druid, but the Primeval Companion one came out, and that had me very excited. But I, like I said, I think it's it's almost there. Maybe you have a fix that you've updated, and you can let me know in the comments down below what you like or what adjustments you've made to make it beneficial to use at your table. So anyway, folks, thank you again all so much for watching, and I'll see you all next time.